Now, our text for this afternoon is the verse 7 of Romans chapter 15, where we read, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Uh, last week we started uh, a short series using the little phrase, one another, as our starting point, And we looked at the command of the Saviour to love one another. And in so doing, we will prove our love for God uh, to this world. Well, today we have another of those one another commands, and it's receive one another. Receive ye one another. In my lifetime, I can't think of a more divided time than the days in which we currently live and I say that as someone who grew up in Northern Ireland, which was a very divided uh, place. You were either orange or green, nationalist or loyalist, republican or unionist. It was a divided community, and it still is in many, many ways. So I know what division is like. But if anything, it seems to have grown worse uh, the longer that I live. Uh, I think we are probably more divided today than what we have ever been. We are suspicious of one another and of one another's motives. And we find that people are increasingly being categorized into one group or another. And we find people are being divided due to their gender, their skin color, their political affiliation, their religion. And it keeps, well, we keep getting put into various groups and boxes, and you're either for us or you are against us. There doesn't seem to be much middle ground to be found anywhere today. And I think the problem is probably exasperated because of the access that we have uh, to one another through online mediums uh, where we are able to maintain a certain amount of anonymity and get involved in debates and shouting matches and slanging matches um, well behind our keyboards we are incredibly divided the sad thing is that this division and exclusion and suspicion isn't just happening out in the world it's happening amongst Christian people also amongst those who profess to be following the Lord Jesus Christ, even amongst those who profess to be worshipping the same Saviour. And I know that certainly one of the accusations that's leveled against the Christian church that we have been carved up into what seems a million little factions and we all think that we are the right one and everyone else is wrong. Now here's what I want us to think about from this portion of scripture today that the Lord really cares about how we look at other people and how we treat other people, especially those who are a little bit different from us. Last week we considered how we are to love those who profess the name of Christ, and that loves to be a demonstration to the world of our love for one another and our love for the Saviour. Well, what about those that are just a little bit different from us? What are we to do with them? Well, from this passage, I want to leave with you three very simple thoughts. First of all, our habit of excluding one another. Then God's call to accept one another. And then thirdly, why it really matters. So let's deal with the first of those uh, headings, our habit of excluding one another. We've read a little bit from the book of Romans here this afternoon. It's a letter that Paul wrote to the believers in that great city of Rome. And if we want to understand what Paul is saying here in our text, uh, we, have to, uh, well, we have to back up a little bit, to look at it within its context. Because really verse 7 is the conclusion of an argument that he has been making for uh, a little while, certainly from the, la the previous chapter. If you go back into chapter 14, you find that Paul says, For one believeth, that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So he's saying one person has a faith that allows them to eat anything, 
Another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. So in the same church you had meat-eating Christians and there were vegetarian Christians. And the vegetarians were abstaining from meat, not because of health reasons, but because of religious reasons. Look forward a few verses down to verse 5 of chapter 14. He says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So not only were there divisions of meat eaters and non-meat eaters, there was a division amongst those who considered one day to be more sacred than another, while another group considered every day alike. So in the same church, you had those who observed the Sabbath day, and some of the religious holidays like Passover and Yom Kippur and then you had people who didn't observe any special days. Then one other example. In verse 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine. So not only have you divisions amongst the meat eaters and the non-meat eaters, there was division over those who obviously drank wine and those who didn't. So you can see the situation. In the same church, you had meat eaters, and vegetarians, Sabbath keepers and non-Sabbath keepers, drinkers and non-drinkers, and you're saying, so what? Well, the thing is, each of the people in those groups believed that they were right. The other side was wrong. And there was a lot of judgment and suspicion and exclusion. And I suspected those groups divided into smaller groups because you had the Sabbatarian meat eaters and you had the non sabbatarian meat eaters and neither the two could see eye to eye on every point of doctrine. And Paul's rightly concerned about this because with each division and each category, the, groups get lo- the number of groups gets larger but the number of people in the groups gets smaller until you stand alone individually and we have evidences of Christians in the past who couldn't worship with anybody because they couldn't find anyone else that agreed with them in every single point as they believed. And so they excluded themselves from Christian worship and fellowship and found themselves standing alone. And Paul's concerned that this doesn't become the case. He's bothered by that. And so he, he speaks to that end. And And I was thinking of of this text, this verse 7, to receive one another. I thought perhaps rather than simply applying it to the Romans, the church that Paul was speaking to, what about ourselves? What about this congregation? Are we like that? I started to think perhaps of examples of how Christians divide today and the issues that separate us but really shouldn't. And I came up with a, well, a list of some sorts of things that might divide us. We might divide along theological issues. The Roman church was divided over whether Christians should eat meat or observe the Sabbath, but what about us? The Christian church is divided today over styles of worship. It's divided today over whether they believe God created the world and Billions of years, we think it's six literal days. We think to ourselves, well, they obviously don't take the Bible literally. How can we worship and fellowship with them? Or what about our views of the end times? We all believe or profess to believe that Christ is coming again. We all agree on that part, but there are a number of variations as to how we see that working out. And there have been literally new churches started, new denominations, based upon having the right view on their opinion on the return of Christ. And they divide from others who who don't agree as they do. We have churches that have divided on the issue of baptism. I, I, I find it incredulous that you could have a denomination that would accept a Charles Spurgeon and refuse a John Calvin. But the two of them couldn't sit together and worship in the same building because of a party line and baptism. There, there are theological issues that separate churches and Christians. There are cultural issues that divide amongst Christians. I suppose that a more recent example would be 
here in Australia, in the Australia Day celebrations, there are Christians are divided over whether you should or shouldn't celebrate Australia Day. And there are people that have strong opinions on both sides of that issue. What about the sanctity of life? Of abortion and euthanasia, there are Christians divided on those issues. Oh, we wonder how we really could be. But they, we are. The significance of marriage, social justice demands. Christians divide on cultural issues and we're again suspicious of those who take a, a differing uh, opinion. So we have theological issues, we've got cultural issues, we've got lifestyle issues. The Roman church, there was dis disagreement about eating and drinking. Well, we still argue about lifestyle things. The point is, we are no different than the Christians that Paul was writing to in Rome. We are filled with little groups and subgroups and cliques and factions and of course whatever group we happen to be in is the right one and everyone else is wrong. We haven't even begun to touch on, on ethnic churches, Russian Orthodox churches. You have to belong to a church from the motherland. There I even mentioned Dutch Reformed churches or Scandinavian Lutheran churches or Scottish or Irish Presbyterian churches. And if you're not from our little group then you're really out of place. I hope you don't feel that way. But you're out of place. The, the point is we're not any different than those that Paul was writing to. I want us to realise that this is a verse that applies to us. And I trust that God is, is working on us to make us more like Christ. But there's still that tendency to think that my views are right. And those that don't agree with me, they're just, well, they're just a little bit off. And that's what's happening here. That's what's happening. There's a tendency for us to separate and to divide over a number on a variety of issues. It's human nature to a certain extent. Well, God's call to us is rather to receive one another. Or if I could put it another way, to be accepting of one another. So, in the Church of Rome, there were these different groups, meat eaters and vegetarians, Sabbath keepers and non-Sabbath keepers, drinkers and non-drinkers, splintering into different groups, each of them thinking that they were right and the others were wrong. And look what God says to them in, in verse 10 of Romans 14. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, if that person that you think is so wrong, if they really are wrong, well, they'll answer to God for it. Not answer to you, they'll answer to God. There's one judge over us all, and it's not you. So stop being so critical about these non-essential matters, meat drinking or vegetable eating or whatever it is you think is so important. Stop being so adamant about your own petty little opinions. And if that person is truly wrong, allow the Lord to deal with it. Allow him to correct it. Allow him to set uh, the matter before him and to rule and adjudicate. Here's the thing. Have the humility to realize that you might be wrong. And that we will stand one day before God and give an account also. It's a call to humility. It's a call to stop writing off other people who have taken a different point of view on certain issues than what we have. To be more open, more receptive. Receive one another, Paul says. Stop being so exclusive and so narrow and so tribal in what you believe. Now, let me tell you what it doesn't say here in Romans 14 and Romans 15. It doesn't say, don't have an opinion about issues such as these. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that thou shalt not have an opinion on eating meat or observing special days or drinking alcohol or any other divisive uh, thing. It doesn't say don't have an opinion on it. 
doesn't say that you can't have political uh, issues in mind or that there shouldn't be cultural issues that you're concerned about. It's good to have an opinion. We need to have opinions on these matters. We need to have thought about them. We need to have to look at all of the issues and come to a conclusion about them. That's why we have, we have opinions and positions on things like abortion and euthanasia. We are called, however, to hold those views with humility. We are to have opinions. And neither does it say that we should hold those opinions loosely. That we're casual in what we believe, that we don't think that it matters, that, that it doesn't say that either. There are things that we're fully convinced about, uh, and so we ought to be. And this verse doesn't say that we should hold our opinions loosely and be willing to set them aside. But we do recognize that there is a difference between essential things and non-essential things. And the issues that are being discussed here in, in Romans 14 and Romans 15, meat, eating, observing special days, those are non-essentials. Those are issues upon which good Christians throughout the centuries have disagreed and will continue to disagree. And I hope that when you think of the modern day examples that we could use, that they are also issues upon which good Christians have disagreed. And those things that are non-essential are the things that we should hold loosely. The things that are essential we hold too tightly. There are essentials. If you read through the doctrinal statement of our denomination, you'll see that there are really just a, a handful of things that we consider to be essential. The absolute authority and divine verbal inspiration of the Old and New Testaments as being the Word of God, we consider that to be essential. The existence of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The deity of Christ, the virgin birth, his substitutionary death, his literal resurrection from the dead, his visible and personal return. Those are things we consider to be essential, that they're not up for debate. These are the same things that you will find in the historic creeds of Christian churches uh, throughout the world. These are the things that we earnestly contend for. These are the matters that we take or stand upon. Allow someone to deny these and we will stand opposed from them. We will separate from them. But in the passage today we're looking at things that God has called us to be accepting of one another about. And he's not talking about the essentials but the non-essentials. Paul puts it this way in verse 17 of Romans 14. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not found in the non-essentials. When we're focusing upon the secondary issues like meat eating or drinking wine or political persuasions or the details of end time events, if we make those the main point, we're missing the point. When you joined this church, when you attached yourself to it, no one asked what your political viewpoint was. Because it's, it's not a matter of fellowship. I don't care if you lean to the left or to the right or are centrist in your position. Those things don't concern me. I have my opinions, and no doubt they filter through in the things that I say, but they're non-essentials. We want to keep the main thing as the main thing. The Lord Jesus Christ should be the center of all that we say and do. There's a very famous saying that originates back, I think, in the 1600s, and is still quoted today. In essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, charity. The non-essential issues 
We give liberty and freedom of personal choice to allow different points of view and still be accepting of them. It doesn't mean we'll agree with them. It doesn't mean that we won't debate them or discuss them or try to persuade about them. But we don't make it a matter of fellowship. It's tempting sometimes just to try and score points and prove that we are right and they are wrong and to shoot down every other argument. That's why Paul says in verse 5 of Romans 15 that the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. To have the same attitude of mind towards each other as Christ has towards you. Patience and encouragement, consolation. That's not something we typically have in ourselves Maybe in small measure, but we need the variety that comes from God. We need the patience and consolation that comes through an increasing relationship with God, our dependence upon Him. If we really want to see how it's done, we look right at the Savior. It says we are to have the same attitude or mind one toward another according to Christ Jesus. And so when we look at our text... It says, receive ye one another as Christ received you. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one throughout all of recorded history who had the correct view on every single issue. Essentials, non-essentials, the Lord Jesus has and had the wisest view on everything. And he didn't use it as a weapon to exclude people. He came seeking out those that were different from himself, extremely different. He accepted all kinds of people, even people like you and me. And the Lord says, start treating others the same way that you have been treated. The Lord took us in with all of our faults and all of our foibles and all of the things that we've got mixed up and messed around and the faults and opinions that we hold to. And yet the Lord has brought us into his kingdom. He's working upon us. He's shaping us by his love and by his spirit. Treat others as the Lord has treated us. So why does it matter? Well, there are two reasons why it matters. There's a secondary reason and there's a primary reason. We'll get the secondary reason out of the way first of all. The reason that it matters that we receive one another is because of how it affects the world around us. Last week when we looked at John chapter 13, remember what the Lord said, love one another. And as we love one another, then people will know that you're my disciple. If we love one another. So when the world looks upon Christians bickering over politics or end time theories, it has an effect upon them. We look ridiculous. Who would want to be part of a group like that? They claim to love the same God and here they are doing nothing but fighting and falling out with one another. But if they are to see us holding our differences with humility and grace and focusing upon the things that we have in common as Christ's followers, then that's a powerful witness and testimony. It shows them there's something really happening in the lives of those people. So so I want to challenge you, before you make that next Facebook post or send out that next Twitter or, or go on your next rant about that political issue that's burning away in your heart and mind, ask yourself, is it, is it an essential or a non-essential? Is it going to divide and separate, or is it going to bring people, the people of Christ closer together and to a, a harmony with what Christ teaches himself? I, I think sometimes that our arguments produce more heat than light. Do we really want to be using our our influence, our voice for that? How it will impact the world? But you know the primary reason 
is given to us in verse 6. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that we want to be receptive or accepting of one another is that we might glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It glorifies him. It shows honor and respect to him. How we treat one another, how we accept one another, reflects upon God. It reflects upon him. Now, you know me, you've known me for a long time now. I'm a father of four children, and I have a confession to make. They don't always get along perfectly. I know you're shocked. I know you're shocked. The truth is sometimes they bicker, and they annoy one another, and they know the buttons to press and the strings to pull in order to get a reaction from one another, and they do it very well. But as a father, it thrills my heart when I see them getting along with one another and loving one another and looking out for one another, even with their obvious differences and points of view. It thrills my heart when I see them getting along with one another. And as a father, it brings me joy. And I think that when it comes to God, that it brings joy to him when his children get along. It glorifies him. That we, may glor- that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, on that basis, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Let me give you just three very quick examples of how we can seek to live this out in the day to day. Pray for those that you disagree with. Pray that if they are wrong, that the Lord will bring them to an awareness of his truth and change them into his way of thinking. Pray that if you're wrong, that the Lord will do the same for you and bring you to his truth. Pray that your differences might not overshadow the love that ought to be there amongst God's children. So pray. That's the first thing I would say. Pray. Pray for me. Pray for the work here. Pray for God's blessing upon the services and the outreach and the things that we do. But don't stop praying when you've prayed for this congregation. Pray for other churches. Pray for the work of God across this land. Pray for the work of God in other lands. Pray that God's word would go out and that souls would be saved and his church would be built up in love and faith and testimony. That's what we should be doing, receiving one another, praying for one another. When we pray for ministries like our own, that God might be pleased to bless them. Does that mean we're going to be in total agreement with other churches round about us? No, I I don't think so. In some cases there are major differences uh, and we hold to those differences rather firmly. But when it comes to individual believers and those that love the Lord, we should seek to focus on the things we have in common. And I, I believe the Lord is glorified when we treat one another with that graciousness and with respect receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Hold tight to the essentials, but hold loosely to the non-essentials. And when we do that, I trust that our faith will be a welcoming one. There will be an attractiveness about it and God will be glorified. And so may there be that spirit of unity evidenced amongst us. We look at the Bible times, the Pharisees told everyone that they had to be just like us, dress like us, act like us, behave like us, think like us, or else you're not welcome with us. You know what it says in Luke chapter 15 and verse 2? The scribes and the Pharisees complained about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what they said? This man receives sinners 
and eats with them. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. They completely rejected those that were different. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus Christ came to eat with sinners? Not to reject them just because they were different than he was. The Lord Jesus received us when we were yet lost and guilty and hell deserving. He saved us by his grace. And he's transforming us more and more into his image. We find that attractiveness in Christ and we want to be more like him. We find that he's received men and women and young people from all races and nations and kingdoms and tongues. And he makes them one in himself. And as Christ has received us, let us therefore receive one another. That God may be glorified. May the Lord help us to be such in his kingdom. Facilitators of his peace. Bringing harmony where there's division. Bringing love where there is separation. And may the Lord be pleased to glorify his great name. And bring his church united and glorified into his kingdom. Let's bow in prayer. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank thee for thy precious word. We recognize that so often we fall far short from the glorious standard that's set before us. We allow petty divisions to separate those that should be united in faith in Christ. We pray that thou would help us to love even as we have been loved, and to minister in the cause of Christ, and to set before the people those things that are essential, and to set apart and set aside those things that are non-essential, not seeking to cause division, but to bring unity where possible in the kingdom of God. To bless thy word to our hearts, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.